Hi, this is Nick Vizai. And this is another video in our series of videos for hydraulics. And today we're going to talk about surface overflow rate and weir overflow rate. I want to share this screen with you. We'll get started with our presentation. Okay, hydraulic series, surface overflow rate, weir overflow rate. This is, of course, is a series of license exam training modules that I've been putting together. It teaches hydraulics to operators, both distribution and plant operators. And we cover problems that, in math that tend to show up on our exams. Uh, in water plants and distribution systems, of course, we have a lot of hydraulic principles that we've got to follow. And all of them take some kind of math that we've got to learn to master. We need that math to determine things like detention times, pressures, head-on pumps, and elevated tanks. We need that math to determine velocities and flow rates as the water moves through the system. And of course, we need that math to determine the amount of energy it takes, the horsepower it takes to move that water through our system. So all of those calculations are necessary. Some of them even have to be done in order to do other calculations such as dosage and feed rates. So we need to master the math for hydraulics. So let's get started on that. I'll talk a little bit about overflow rates and sedimentation basins themselves. Overflow rates, which are sometimes talked about or known as loading rates, they're just simply numerical values. They have a number on them. And those numbers describe safe operating levels for operators. We have to rely on those uh, major unit processes. We're going to have surface overflow rates and weir overflow rates attached to our sedimentation basins that we should follow. Of course, when the engineers uh, design uh, and configure sedimentation basins, they're going to use surface overflow rates and weir overflow rates. The regulators are going to use them to approve that design. So again, like any other major unit process, when the engineers design and build something for us and the regulator approves it, then we should be able to operate it properly as long as we stay within those parameters. What we're discussing today are surface overflow rate, which we sometimes write as SOR. I'll use that through the video. And the same thing with the weir overflow rate, we're gonna call that WOR. Talk about surface overflow rate first. Now a design engineer is gonna specify a rectangular or a circular basin that has a detention time with as much as four hours for sedimentation. And that basin is going to have a surface overflow rate, typically no greater than 0 0.5 gallon per minute per square foot. And those numbers in that formula are the gallon per minute, which is a flow rate, uh, and that's the flow rate that's actually traveling instantaneously through that basin. And the square feet is the surface area of the basin, which is obtained by multiplying the length times the width for a rectangular basin and by multiplying the diameter squared times 0 0.785 for circular basins, or you can use the pi r squared also. Notice that the depth of the basin is not used when you do surface overflow rate or weir overflow rate calculations. You don't have to worry about how deep the basin is. It may have an effect on how we do things, but it does not enter into these equations. Many regulating authorities allow a higher surface overflow rate that you calculate. Uh, that's if the bases are equipped with higher rate technologies such as tubes or plate setters, but we're not gonna talk about those today. That's another video. <coughs> okay, surface overflow rate and its relationship to settling. Surface overflow rates are kept as, reason, as a reasonable low number because flock material is not gonna settle if our rates get too high. That's why we wanna know how to calculate surface overflow rate because it'll tell us if, if flock, from, flock is not gonna settle properly. Gravity is at work in a said basin. It pulls down on the flock particle that we've created in our process, pulls down continuously. But we're going to overcome those if the flow through our basin is uh, a little bit too aggressive. Particles will settle because they're dense and compact. They'll settle easily up into a point. And then when that point is reached, then things aren't going to settle properly because we're going to overcome gravity if we push the water fat too fast through there. And that tends to happen, we've, we've determined, and engineers have studied. When the surface overflow rate creeps up and gets over the 0 0.5 gallon per minute per square foot rate, that's why they want you to keep it at that rate or lower. And they'll design the basin thus. So operators should always be aware of the periods during which their surface overflow rate nears that exceedance. If you're starting to creep up to that 0 0.5, you need to, you need to know what and you need to know why. And hopefully you can predict these rates. And that can sometimes happen in a water plant when you have higher than normal flows brought on by a leak or maybe customer demand, you should be painfully aware of what's going on about those kind of things because they can, it can increase your SOR. You might have a basin out of service for maintenance, so that's something that has to be planned for. 
or maybe certain times of the day, uh, your recycle flow is a little too high a rate. Let's talk about surface flow rate also as a velocity. The uh, traditional expression of surface flow rate as gallon per minute per square foot is old fashioned, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Now we tend to talk about surface flow rate, overflow rate as the velocity, uh, but we still see the SOR calculation on exam sort. We still teach it that way. Uh, that's what I'm doing today. But you should also be aware that the overflow rate is really a velocity that describes base and loading. And here's the proof mathematically. If the surface overflow rate is in gallons per minute per square foot, which I've, which I've shown you, you can easily change that to the same value, same amount of cubic feet per minute per square feet, same thing, just by multiplying or dividing by 7.48. So we change gallons of cubic feet, it's still the same amount of water going over, over the weirs. We can then write that out longhand as feet times feet times feet over minutes divided by feet times feet. And of course, two feet are gonna cancel out in the numerator with two feet canceling out of the denominator, leaving us in feet per minute. And that's simply a, a velocity. Feet per minute can then further be expressed as centimeters per second, which is also a velocity. So just to show you that we are talking about velocities, but we're gonna do the old fashioned way of doing it. All right, let's move on to weir overflow rate which engineers sometimes uh, call weirs launders when they put them in your basins. The one launders are at the ends of sedimentation basins are typically are put there so they can skim off the clear water at the top, the end of the basin and bring that over to the filters. So they'll, they'll skim off the first, the top inch or two inches of water only. Weirs can be longitudinal or they can be perpendicular to the direction of flow. They can be double-sided. Uh, but they must have enough length to them so that each linear foot of launder or weir is not loaded with more than 20,000 gallons per day. So I know if I, if I can only go up to 20,000 gallons per day for each foot of, of linear length of uh, weir that I have, and my plant is 20 million, then I, can know, I know that I'm gonna have to multiply that by a certain number to get up to 20 million. That's how many weirs I'm gonna need. So the weir overflow rate, WOR, is gallons per day flow rate divided by the length of weirs of feet. It's really that simple. Uh, note, uh, if you have a double-sided weir, which sometimes shows up on exams, and we are going to show you an example of one of those, the weir actually counts as twice its length. You know, you have two sides to it, 10 feet. An example here, if you have a 24-foot length of weir that has two sides that's pulling water from, then it's actually 45 feet, 48 feet of weir length, so bear that in mind. Here's an example, a picture of uh, an actual double-sided weir. This is in the sedimentation basin at the Lake County, Ohio Bacon Road Water Treatment Plant. We thank them for letting us use their picture. You can see the weir is going perpendicular to the flow, against, really actually against the flow rate. And the weirs have notches on both sides and they're pulling water from the top portion. Notice uh, they're sitting on top of uh, a set of um, tube settlers there. So when I count the, when I measure the length of this weir, I get to multiply it times two to get my actual weir length. Now this weir has notches cut into it at evenly spaced intervals, and that's how they work properly. Uh, these notches, which are actually V notches, shaped in the form of a V, actually are measuring devices. The engineer knows that the depth of the water over the V itself can be measured and computed into a flow rate. That engineer knows what that flow rate is for each V he or she can change that into a total flow rate by multiplying the number of V notches that he or she carves into those, into those uh, notches that they carve into the launder itself. Now, a little note about that, when these uh, weirs are put into your basin, you have to keep them level. If they tilt to one side or the other through ice formation, for example, or for maintenance, for maintenance practices, uh, they're gonna pull from one side a little harder than they're supposed to, and from the other side, not as hard as they're supposed to. On the side that they're pulling too hard from, they'll actually have enough lifting value to take uh, sludge off the bottom of the basin and bring it up over the weir. So you have to be very careful about that. These devices are intricate pieces of measurement devices and they gotta be leveled and kept properly, maintained properly. Why do engineers put V notches in weirs? You know, they used to put just rectangular notches in weirs, but they found that putting V notches, they could control the flow better and they could even make more meaningful measurements in them. So that's why they put these in them now. The basic principle is that the discharge is directly related to the water depth above the notch of the V. So the engineer knows as, as the water creeps up higher than the notch of the, than the bottom of the V, that adds to the flow rate exponentially, I suppose, the way they look at it. So it's a measurement of the head over the, over the V notch and it's computed to gallons per minute. 
Also, uh, I noted that the design causes small changes in discharge to uh, small change in discharge to have a large effect on the depth uh, as that changes. So a small change in B, which is very easy to accomplish, is more easily measured as a, as a higher uh, value. Instead of measuring a very small amount, you get to measure a higher depth and make it a more meaningful measure. So what that means is the weir itself is actually a measuring device. The more weirs I put in there, the more I can measure the flow rate coming through the plant. So with many of these small devices cut into even spaces in the launder itself, the design engineer can predict how many were going to be needed. Another way to look at that is this way. If the engineer knows how far apart to space each V-notch in the launder and knows how much volume can safely be produced by each V-notch, and he or she can know exactly how many of those weirs you're going to have to have, and that's how they design these bases. They know what each V-notch puts out in gallons per day per foot, multiplies it times the number of gallons you actually need, and then you can figure out how many feet of, of uh, linear space, you, linear uh, wonder that you need. Now, most state regulators require that the weir overflow rate at a minimum, at a maximum, should not exceed 20,000 gallons per day per foot. So the engineer that designs that knows that they got to stick within that parameter. Let's look at an actual calculation for surface overflow rate and, and uh, weir overflow rate. We're going to use their example, the Aquarius plant, which we've been going back and forth to, and we appreciate the Lake County Department of Utilities letting us use their data. Always appreciated their comp uh, contribution to operator education. So for the Aquarius plant, they've got four sedimentation basins. Each of them is 41 feet wide and 190 feet long, and they have a depth of 14 and a half feet. They have eight double-sided weirs, each of them 17 and a half long, seven and a half foot long in each basin, but they're double-sided. So you remember that in your calculations. So given that information, let's calculate the following problems and assume that the plant is at its max flow of 20 MGD. So when you do these calculations, we're at max flow of 20 MGD. So calculate the surface overflow rate in gallon per minute per square foot, and also try it in centimeters per minute as a velocity. When you're done with that, try the calculation for weir overflow rate. Calculate that in gallon per minute, gallon per day per foot, but with only three sedimentation bases in service. If you want to try those calculations, now would be the time to stop the video, pause the video, and try your try them out on a piece of paper. Calculate them out, and then go on to the next slide to see if you got the right answers. And I hope you did. For now, I'm going to move on to that page and explain the answers. So here's the calculation for Aquarius water treatment plant surface overflow and weir overflow rates. Surface overflow first. Each basin I knew was 50, uh, was 41 feet by 190 or 7,790 square feet. I know that the flow rate through the plant at max is 20 million gallons per day. So if I divide that by 1,440 minutes per day, I come up with a flow rate of 13,888 gallons per minute. So it's a matter of dividing the flow rate of 13,888 gallons per minute by the surface area of a basin times four basins. And I'm going to come up with 0 0.445 gallon per minute per square foot, which comes just under the regulating authority Ohio EPA requirement of 0 0.5 at a maximum. And that was when this plant was designed in 1984, 85 era, that's exactly what they were following. So they sized the basins in order to, to come under that 0 0.5. If I wanted to change that or calculate that in inches per minute velocity, I would take the 13,888 gallons per minute and change it to cubic feet per minute, and divide it by the square feet and come up with 0.596 feet per minute. And I could change that to inches per minute divided by multiplying by 12. And then since there are 2.454 centimeters in an inch, I just multiply the inches by 2.54. I come up with a velocity of 1.81 centimeters per minute. Now, if you saw the video on jar testing, you'd know that all you had to do is take the 0.445 gallon per minute per square foot and multiply it by 4.06, which is in the table at the end of this presentation anyway. So there's a shortcut you can use. I just want to do it out long here for you. And of course, the last calculation was the weir overflow rate. I told you that each basin is, uh, has eight double-sided weirs that are 17 and a half feet long. So I take the 20,000 gallon per day per, per foot uh, rate divided by 17 and a half feet with two sides, eight weirs and three basins, only three basins in service. And I come up with a weir overflow rate of 23,810 gallon per day per foot, which is over the design rate that they would like you to, the EPA would like you to be under. So uh, Aquarius operators know that if they have to take a basin out of service for maintenance, they have to be very careful. If they start to approach uh, over 15 million for the day, uh, they're starting to go over that 20, 
thousand gallons per day, 20 million gallons per day per foot. So they got to be careful. Okay, so with that slide, I'm going to end. This is the conversion table of factors that you can see at the end of, end of each of our hydraulic series. Uh, you notice the, the last entry that we have there at the bottom is gallons per minute per square foot changed to centimeters per minute by multiplying by the 4.06, which you could have used for one of your problems. But always refer to the tables at the end of the hydraulic series, and then you'll be set. Hopefully you got something out of this. A couple of buttons are going to scroll up now. You'll see those come up. Uh, click on those if you want to see more videos or if you want to subscribe to this channel. And hopefully these are helping out for your exam. So we'll stop here and say thank you.